Today we're going to talk about markets and the various kinds of market structures. So as a quick review, what exactly is a market? A market is any arrangement where buyers and sellers come together to exchange things. This doesn't have to be a physical place, like a farmer's market, although it could be. It could also be online, or it could just be out there in the ether, like the job market. So it doesn't have to be a physical place, but it is any place where buyers and sellers come together to make exchanges. The first kind of market that we're going to look at is a perfectly competitive market. Perfect competition is an arrangement in which there are large numbers of firms that produce the same product. It gets a little bit more complicated than that. So how do I know if I'm in a market that is perfectly competitive? Well, we're going to look at four uh, qualifications. Number one, there have to be many buyers and sellers, like a whole lot, like thousands, tens of thousands. Many buyers and sellers so that no individual is powerful enough to influence the total market quantity or the market price. And so therefore, everyone must accept the price. They are price takers. The consumers, the buyers must accept the price. And the sellers really can't raise their prices. They just kind of have to accept whatever the going rate is. The products that are being sold are identical. There's no significant difference between the products that are sold by the different suppliers. Now, let's pause there for a second. Are there any situations in which all of the products sold in the market are identical? Well, it's not that common, but we typically see this when we're discussing things like commodities. Commodities are products that are the same regardless of who produces them. You can think of this like petroleum, or notebook paper, or milk, or corn, or wheat, a lot of natural resources like that. When you go and you open up a can of corn and you take a bite, you can't tell me which farm that corn came from because corn is corn. And so if we're dealing with a product like this, there's a decent chance that we might be discussing a perfectly competitive market. The other two qualifications for a perfectly competitive market are informed buyers and sellers and free market entry and exit. Let's talk about informed buyers and sellers. Individuals know enough about the market to be able to get the best deal they can get. Information is widely available. It's on display. People don't have to do much work to find out the prices of one good versus another. And then, of course, there is uh, free market entry and exit. It's easy for firms to enter the market, and it's also easy for firms to leave the market when they aren't making much money. Let's unpack this a little bit. What might make it difficult for a firm to enter a market or to enter or to exit a market? Well, when we're talking about the things that make it difficult to enter, we use the term barriers to entry, a factor that makes it difficult for a new firm to enter a market. What could this be? Well, it could be something like startup costs or technology. Let's take an example of uh, an automobile mechanic. Now, if tomorrow your boy wanted to start an auto repair shop, it's not exactly going to be easy. Number one, I don't have the knowledge. <laughs> I don't have the expertise. I did not go to school or get any sort of training to do that. So if I wanted to get that training, that's going to be pretty costly and time consuming. Um, and furthermore, the amount of tools and technology I might need to use in order to start my business are not readily available. So the idea of me simply this tomorrow deciding to start an auto repair shop is pretty low because there's high barriers to entry. This is not true of all businesses, though. Perhaps something like a landscaping business. Certainly there's a certain amount of expertise and skill and knowledge and some technology involved in it. But when compared to something like auto repair, the startup costs are much lower. So if we have high startup costs or require a lot of technology or a lot of education in order to enter the market, those are high barriers to entry, and that probably means we're not dealing with a perfectly competitive market. So those are our qualifications. Perfect competition, you have a many firms, like lots and lots and lots, and many uh, buyers. The variety of goods, none. They're basically all the same. Very low if if uh, maybe no barriers to entry whatsoever. And what control do these sellers have over the price? They have none. They are price takers. What this means practically is that in perfectly competitive markets, 
uh, prices are generally at the lowest sustainable uh, number. There's not a lot of markup. There's not a lot of profit being made. Perfectly competitive markets are very efficient because the cost of the product in the market, uh, the price, I should say, is equal to the opportunity cost. But other than that, we're talking about relatively low prices and not a lot of profit being made for a lot of these firms. So are there examples of such markets? Well, the truth is that there's not a whole lot, but some that might meet the qualifications would be something like a farmer's market. In a farmer's market, as a person walks through from table to table, they're going to see the various goods that farmers have brought to the market. Prices are going to be displayed there, so all the information is known. There's no practical difference between the tomatoes from one farmer and the tomatoes from another farmer, uh, which means that uh, those different farmers who are competing with one another really can't afford to, to raise their price very much. If all the farmers selling tomatoes at the, at the farmer's market have decided they're going to sell them for, I don't know, a uh, dollar a piece, then it doesn't make sense for one of the farmers to say, well, I'll charge two dollars because no one, uh, no buyer would pay that. Why? Because they can just buy another identical tomato for a lower price. And so prices are low. Uh, there are many buyers and sellers. And so this is going to meet many of the, the qualifications necessary to be a perfectly competitive market. Some would argue that the stock market is perfectly competitive. Why? Because, well, any share of stock is identical to the other share of stock. I have no uh, control over the price. There are many, 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 many buyers and sellers. Uh, I could enter the market and buy them. I could leave the market and sell them relatively easy. But other than that, it's kind of hard to find examples of perfectly competitive markets in the real world. At the opposite end of the spectrum, is a monopoly, the most imperfect of competition. What is monopoly? Well, it's a great game that I enjoyed playing as a child, but it actually is a lot more than that. Let's think about the game monopoly for a second. Uh, what is the goal in monopoly? The goal is to control the board to own all of the uh, properties of a particular color, right? And when you do that, what can you do? You can jack up the price. You can charge a lot for people to stay in your hotels. This is kind of what a monopoly is in the real world. It is a market dominated by a single seller. Barriers keep other firms from entering, and prices, well, goodness gracious, they're pretty high. So what are the qualifications of monopoly? Number one, a single seller who sells the product. Many barriers to entry. It's very difficult for new firms to get in. Or is there a variety of goods? No, there's there's no variety of goods whatsoever because it's one seller selling generally one thing. And what about prices? Well, unlike perfect competition with the lowest sustainable price, here prices are much, much higher. Generally speaking, it's in monopolies you're going to find the highest prices because the seller has complete control over those prices. So the number of firms, one. The variety of goods, none. Barriers to entry, complete, or at least very, very high. And complete control over prices. So how do we get monopolies in the first place? Well, there's different ways that monopolies are created and destroyed, for that matter. Um, let's talk about uh, the first, which is an economy of scale, factors that cause a producer's average cost per unit to fall as output rises. What? Well, think of something like a hydroelectric dam. The cost of building a hydroelectric dam is extraordinarily high. It would cost a lot of money. And so if you spread that cost over the first gigawatt of energy that is produced, then it costs a lot of money to produce that first level of output. But what do you do if you want to produce more energy? Well, you just let more water go through the dam. And you spread that cost, the average cost per unit, over all of the, uh, the energy is produced. So very, very high startup costs at the beginning, but then uh, as more and more and more and more and more of the good is produced, the average cost per unit falls. So we see this with the hydroelectric dam. Uh, we see this with things like uh, um, assembly lines, factory production. Some monopolies are formed because it's actually just the best way to do things. 
There are some markets in which it runs most efficiently when there is one large firm that supplies everything. Think of something like the water company. If you live in a city, chances are there's only one water company that, produ that supplies all the water for the entire city. No one's competing for your business. Why? Because it would be terribly expensive to lay new lines of plumbing throughout the entire city. And anytime a new customer wanted to switch over to a new water company, they'd have to pay for all of the digging and the installation of all that. And so it just makes sense that one company provide all of it. In situations like this, like the water company, a natural monopoly, generally these are highly regulated by the government. That's how they're formed. Sometimes monopolies can be destroyed through technology. When new technology comes along that, that uh, really knocks down a lot of the barriers to entry, um, things that were one-time monopolies aren't anymore. Think of something like uh, cell phones. There was a time in this nation's history where there were telephone lines everywhere, and it's very, very expensive to put those telephone lines throughout an entire community, much like the water company. But as technology changed and we get cellular technology, and now we're able to put a tower here and there and everywhere, and you don't need to rely upon all the telephone wires going everywhere, uh, many of those barriers to entry that pre prevented competition in the first place have gone away, and now monopolies have been destroyed. So back on the issue of economies of scale, like we said a moment ago, many monopolies benefit from being able to operate with economies of scale. If we were to put it on a graph, it would look like this. You see the, the initial startup cost, the average cost, is very, very high. But the more we produce, out, as output goes up, we spread that cost over all the production of that hydroelectric dam, of that automobile factory, whatever it is, and we spread that cost out and it gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Uh, to produce over time. Sometimes monopolies can be created with the benefit and the aid of the government. Um, one example would be a patent. This is a technological monopoly. The government provides patents to ensure that companies can profit from the research and have the and they own the exclusive rights to produce their product. What? What are we talking about? Think of something like a pharmaceutical company that spends years researching and developing new drugs, pharmaceutical drugs. They spend lots of money doing that. Well, they're going to want to be able to make a profit when they bring that to market. And so the government issues patents which give uh, the creator of a technology the exclusive right to sell it. Um, and so when a company is granted a patent to produce a pharmaceutical drug, a new invention, a vaccine, something like that, they have the exclusive right and therefore they are a monopoly and this is done with uh, the sanction of the government. Franchises are another example of monopolies. This is where a local authority grants um, a, a, an exclusive right to provide a service within a given market. You can think of something like a national company giving uh, a local owner the ability to own and operate a McDonald's in a small town, a franchise to sell it there. Sometimes the government issues license, uh, licenses to various companies. You can think about it like if, um, I don't know, Coca-Cola is the only one allowed to sell soft drinks within the national parks in this country. They have an exclusive right. They have the license to sell it there. And finally, there are industrial organizations, companies that restrict the number of firms in a market, um, often done with the approval of the government. Think of something like Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball is allowed to determine which baseball clubs exist, which cities get to have a franchise. And they're the only franchises that are allowed to exist within those cities. In many ways, there is a monopoly on professional baseball in the United States. Now, I know some of you out there are saying, well, wait a minute, I heard one time the monopolies are illegal. Sometimes they are. Uh, when we have laws that regulate monopolies, we call those antitrust laws. But organizations like Major League Baseball have what's known as antitrust exemption. The government has allowed them to create a monopoly in which they determine which cities get to have franchises. Not all uh, sports leagues have antitrust exemption. An example would be 
the National Football League. While they certainly exercise a heck of a lot of power, every once in a while you do see that there are other rival organizations that pop up. The USFL in the 80s, the XFL. Uh, these various leagues have existed over time because um, there is no antitrust exemption protection for the NFL. However, for all practical purposes, those leagues are not exactly competitive, which is why many of them no longer exist. Because monopolies have such high prices, it's only natural that some uh, individuals are not going to be willing to pay those high prices. So what do we do in those situations? Do we just say, well, we won't take any money from those people? Eh, not exactly. It's better to get some money than no money at all. Price discrimination is when companies that have market power divide people into groups based on how much they believe those people are willing to pay. They do this through targeted discounts, dividing customers into different groups based upon their willingness to pay. Uh, these are things like senior citizen discounts, student discounts. Many of you, when, if you go to college in the next year or two, you'll find that whatever town your college is in, uh, many of the local businesses will give you a discount if you, they sh you show them your student ID or something like that. Kids eat free. Listen, I got a couple kids. All they do is cost me money. Businesses know this, and they know that if they want to bring in families, sometimes they have to lower the price for children <laughs> in order to get mom and dad to come in. So because prices are generally high for monopolies, um, they know some people will not pay them. And so they come up with schemes, known as price discrimination, to charge different prices to different groups of people based upon some uh, distinctive characteristic. Now, they cannot, they cannot discriminate based upon things that, like uh, race or gender or religion or anything like that. That's not what we're talking about here. But we're saying what are some general characteristics that might define the willingness to pay of a group, a senior citizen, student, family with children, those sort of things. By doing this, they're able to get some revenue out of these different groups when they wouldn't have been able to get any if they kept prices high.